Remember? Not that long ago, we prayed around Christy an awful lot because she took a clay pot, slammed it into the floor. Most of the pieces have been returned. There's a few pieces in Kingsport that I need to go by and pick up. Today at 2 o'clock, we'll gather together. Nancy's already told you you're needed, you're wanted. You see, you're needed and you're wanted because we all know that the more people we have here, the quicker we get it done and we get to go because this is a busy time of the year. And we load ourselves down. And we will adorn this place with the trees and with wreaths and greenery. And we will take this sanctuary and we will dress it. We will clothe it. Because tradition has taught us that when we decorate things, it brings us joy. I prayed about this this morning before I got here, and I really do know better. This is a candle of hope. You see, it's not that often that we decorate It's not that often that we try to beautify a space with brokenness. I dare not put too many there, Jeff, because I know that the district superintendent happens to live across the street. But if we never take time to look at our brokenness, how will we ever come to see the light of hope shining in our lives? I want to thank Chris and Kenny and the others that were in the kitchen when we had the United Methodist Men breakfast. Chris challenged me to do a sermon series looking at Christmas, at Advent, Look, through the lens of Joseph. How in the world do you do that? Well, you learn to follow scriptures how you do that. Take a look at the genealogy. I've given you an insert, and I contend that if you will work your way through that at home, we don't have time to do it here. But if you'll work through that, I contend that what you will see in the genealogy is that God has this ability to work through people. Some are good. Matthew lifts up only two names out of that whole genealogy. Out of 42 generations, Matthew chooses two to talk about. That would be Abraham and King David. But look at the genealogy, my friend. There would not be the fulfillment of a promise if it was left just to Abraham and to King David. We say again and again and again that God has this ability to take the brokenness of life, the bad things of life, the evil things of life and turn them in to his own good and his own glory to reveal his own holiness. What if we took that serious? What if for everything that we decorate in this space, this sanctuary, what if for every tree we put up in our home, we spent that much time decorating the house of Jesus Christ. 
Now hang with me. And I'm going to try to explain this. What's the difference between the sanctuary and the house of Jesus Christ? What is the difference between your home, your house, and the house of Jesus Christ? I'm going to try to unpack this. And then we have time to join back here, and you can throw all the questions at me you want to throw, and I'll try to answer them. Look at the genealogy. And we begin to see that Matthew chooses to talk about houses. He's talking about the house of Abraham. We say this, don't we? The God of our fathers. This is the house. The God of our fathers who is Abraham and... Y'all don't know? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Those are all houses friends. And all of those houses come out of the house of Abraham. Let me tell you a story. There's a man named Abraham, or Abram. And Abram had this visitor, and his name was God. God visited Abram. It's in the 12th chapter of Genesis. We looked at that in Sunday school this morning. And he came to him, and he made a promise. Now, here's the nature of a promise. I've tried to set this up over the last few weeks and months. By the very nature of a promise, once somebody makes us a promise, the only thing that we can do is wait for that person to fulfill the promise. And so Abraham was a man who had to learn how to wait. Matthew is telling us from the time that God made a promise to Abram that the people waited. Can you imagine that? 42 generations. They waited 42 generations for God to fulfill the promise that he made to Abram. And what was the promise he made? He said, I will make of you a great nation and I will make your name great. Let's think about the greatness of a name. What's this guy's name? Oh, you call him Mr. Gallier. <laughs> Mr. Gallier. You see, as you sit there, whose authority are you under? I, I want to introduce the wise guys as the house of Galleon. You got it? You got it? The house of Abraham is a recipient of a promise. And notice what's being said here. In order to get to be a great nation... It takes, what, a thousand people to be a nation? A thousand families to be a nation? A hundred thousand? Would a hundred thousand families be enough to make a nation? Or, or about, how about two million? How many families does it take to make a great nation? And notice what God is doing. God is starting with one person who has no children. And he's going to make of that one a great nation? Come on now. And so, my friends, we can decorate this house and we can adorn it. But what if we also took time to decorate and adorn the house of Jesus Christ? And what is the difference? And now I'm going to tell you the difference. In order to get to a great nation, you've got to have a lot of families that buy into this idea that they will sit under one king like Galleon. 
How many people are in your band? Should I ask him beforehand? Listen. God made a promise to Abram. And if you take any of the bad people out of that genealogy, you can't get to David. You understand that? Matthew chooses to include some evil, mean, despicable people in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And we say that we would not adorn the house of brokenness? Remember, David finally settled down and he had his kingdom build him a big pine cedar house. And this is my, this is my view of it. He, he's looking out of the back of the house and he sees God slumming in a tent. That's my take. And he says, well, I know what I'm going to do because God's bigger than me and better than me. I'm going to build God a house. And originally Nathan said, God is with you. Do as you please. And then the Lord God came to a prophet named Nathan. And the prophet was the one who told the king what was going on with God. And here's God's message. I've never asked you to build me a house. I've never asked anybody that's come before you to build me a house. And my house will never be built by human hands. But I will make you a promise, David. I'm going to promise you that there is a son that will be born to your house. And that son that will be born will sit on your throne... How long, church? Forever. For eternity. Let me tell you who the son is that was promised to Abraham. It's the same son that was promised to David. And if you read the genealogy in Matthew, it takes 42 generations of people waiting before God fulfilled the promise. And remember the nature of a promise. The one who made it is the only one who can keep it. But that doesn't mean that you and I and other people don't try to force the hand of the one who made the promise. And so, lo and behold, Chris, I didn't really know this. I guess I should have paid attention that day in seminary. Don't you laugh at me. You can laugh at me all you want, as long as you'll let me laugh at you. All right? This Jesus was born of Joseph and Mary, Mary and Joseph. And they both come from the house of David. So let's come together at 2 o'clock today. Let's decorate this faith. I have friends of mine. I have this one friend of mine, Steve Wilson. Steve, Steve Wilson lives and bleeds orange. And in their house, including the bathrooms, every room in the house, and including the bathrooms, has a UT Christmas. Here's my challenge for Lynn. For every space that we decorate, let's take time to decorate the house of Jesus Christ. You see, this house was built by human hands, and this is a wonderful, glorious, sacred space. But let me tell you about the house of Jesus Christ. It's not built of sticks and bricks. It's not warmed by a furnace or cooled by HVAC. The house that God promised is a house that is built by God's hands. And it's made of hearts 
and souls and minds. And so how would we decorate one another's hearts and souls and minds? How would we decorate the house of Jesus Christ? Because a house, my friend, is made of a family. Well, let me recommend this. How about, how about if we began to adorn one another's hearts? What would be fitting? What would be a fitting decoration or a garment? What would be a fitting way to dress and clothe the heart of our brothers and sisters here? Would it not be in purple? Would it not be to remind them that at their baptism that God made a promise to them, that God made a promise to you, that He has clothed your heart in purple and that you are no longer a slave to sin, but rather you are a child of God clothed in grace? Are we not, church, saved by grace? What if we began to clothe one another with the royal garments of grace that is greater than all our sin? What if we began to clothe one another as Jesus Christ clothes us? Clothe the heart with grace that is greater than sin by reminding the person who is broken that is seeking to find hope in a very dark world. That at their baptism, this broken became the glory that is clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ. And after we're, we clothe the heart, how about if we begin to clothe the mind, to decorate the mind, that, it might, that our minds might have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. How would we do that? What if we began to clothe one another's minds with less criticism and judgment and to help seal their minds, our neighbors' minds, in the Holy Spirit. Because I contend that what the Holy Spirit did with Jesus and what the Holy Spirit will do with us is lead us not into the temptation that this is the winner, but to deliver us from the brokenness of life Lead us in the way of righteousness. So once we clothe the heart and we clothe the mind, what if we began to clothe and to decorate the house of Jesus Christ? With a pair of sandals. Because only a slave to sin walks barefooted. But remember what God did in the parable of the prodigal? He put a pair of sandals on his son's feet after he had clothed him in a purple robe and after he had put the ring of the seal of the Holy Spirit upon his finger. And why did he clothe him in purple? And why, why did he clothe him in purple? And why did he put the seal of the Holy Spirit around his mind? And why did he put sandals on his feet? It was because he was invited to the feast of the Lord. There's the Christmas decoration. It's where they all begin. It's where they all end. But I'll be here at 2 o'clock. We'll have a little bit of fun. We'll do a little bit of grumbling. We'll do our fair share of complaining. We'll be in a hurry to get up and go. We'll decorate our homes. We'll have parades. But 
this Advent, King Rick. You see, you may be the king of the band, but in the kingdom, brother, in the kingdom, you're a prince. And you're princess. Princess. You're a prince. In the kingdom of heaven. And we'll decorate this thing. And it's built by human hands. But God has invited us. God has called us. Invited us. Just to help people remember that at their baptism, they gave their heart a purple robe. And it's grace greater than all sin. And to cover our mind, He gave us the Holy Spirit because God knows that we're going to continue to struggle with brokenness and sin and strife, but He lead us not into temptation, but does what, church? We pray it every Sunday. Lead us not into temptation. He meets us in our temptation to deliver us from that evil. Come on now. Come on. And then what does He do? Once He has us clothed for the wedding banquet, he invites us to his table, and this table is just like the one that is in heaven. And my daddy, and my granddaddy, and my mother, and my grandmother, and a couple of hundred people that I have had the privilege to stand with at an empty tomb and to bury them. What a privilege, and what an honor, Doug, and what a glory to be able to stand on earth and say, come on. Come on, you who are weary and you who are broken. And let's celebrate the feast together.